Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us for Access City Council. I'm your host, David Riggleman, Communications Director for the City of Las Vegas. On this show, we'll be discussing issues related to Ward 6. And the councilman who represents this ward, councilman and mayor pro tem Steve Ross, joins me now. Hello and welcome. How are you doing? How are you doing? Happy March. Happy uh, March already. Do <laughs> yeah, you believe this? No, time flies. Time flies when you're having fun. I know. <laughs> we're already, you know, three months into the third month of 2016 already. Yeah. It's like, geez. And then this weather we're having. Oh, it's like spring. It's like spring a month yeah, and ago. And we're, so. we're still in the winter right, <laughs> right now. Right. So, well, thanks for having me back on the show. Good to have you back. Good to have you back. Let's talk about Ward 6. Uh, you know it very, very well yep. in, in and out. For the folks out there that aren't exactly sure, we'll show you where Ward 6 is located. It's the, the top of the valley, uh, the, the northwest area, as Councilman says, the great northwest. And if you live in that area, work in that area, of course, you are in the city limits of the city of Las Vegas, and you're out there in, in good old Ward 6. And people who live out there know it's the great northwest as well. That's the, right. The air is cleaner, the people are friendlier, the <laughs> <laughs> and all that, yeah. Less traffic. No, I can't say that. Well, and, and no construction whatsoever, right? None <laughs> at all. Uh, things actually are picking up. Oh, we'll gosh, talk a little yeah. bit more We're about that. Out there. One of the gems coming to your neck of the woods, and you've had a big hand in this. Uh, you, uh, the congressional delegation, uh, the city as a whole, the mayor, Mayor Goodman, played yeah. a big part in this. But it's the whole uh, monument, the national monument that we're going to have out at Tule Springs uh, related to the fossils. So you are very active on social media, and you recently posted uh, this on your Facebook page. Uh, you said, uh, proud to serve on the official Tule Springs Advisory Council. I look forward to the work ahead in creating a national park in our community to be enjoyed for generations to come. That's a huge, huge honor because that's really going to set the course for what this national monument's going to be out there. Yeah, this 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 committee is going to uh, is, is is great, and what a golden opportunity for me to be on this committee at this time in the history of Las Vegas and Southern Nevada. Um, I remember being a little kid and my mom saying, "Hey, we're going out to Tule Springs," and I cringe because it was like driving to Reno. You know, it, it was so like in those far. Days, I know it was out of town, mm -hmm. um, and and it's not anymore. And now we have an opportunity to preserve that area uh, for generations to come. We've got great partnerships with the National Park Service. Uh, the Paiutes have been a great partner yeah, with us too, sure and they're have. just as excited as we are because it's at their doorstep. Mm -hmm. I mean, you kind of got to go through them to get to where to get to go where you want to see out there. So we're really excited about that. That being said, work is not started yet just yet. John Burpee is the new park superintendent. Um, we're going to be working very closely with the National uh, History Museum as, as well, the Can National you, History Museum. Tell everybody in about the significance of the site. For those that don't know, it, it's just a treasure trove of fossils that go back to prehistoric times. They do, they do. There's, there's actual remnants of uh, tusks and fossils and bones laying on the surface out there and we've got to protect that. Yeah. That land was in uh, the management of the Bureau of Land Management for quite some time. Uh, it did take a lot of work, uh, over a year's work, to get it where it is today. You know, several trips back to Washington, D.C., working with our congressional delegation, uh, helping them understand the importance and significance of that for, the, for, for Southern Nevada and for the city of Las Vegas and that, how that's going to affect our tourism. This is a, you know, we've got some oh, beautiful yeah. places in Southern Nevada. Red Rock, Valley of Fire, I mean, the Grand Canyon is not too far away. We've got the Colorado River. You know, this is just another one of those fabulous things that people will, are going to want to see and we can promote that because anybody who has any kind of interest in paleontology uh, understanding dinosaurs and what existed uh, before human beings started walking around on the earth well what kid doesn't want to learn more about dinosaurs exactly. what six-year-old kid doesn't love dinosaurs I've got you know 14 grandchildren all under the age of eight <laughs> and they're all infatuated with dinosaurs of course you know and and that's a cool thing because they're going to learn about that and have that ability to do it especially our relationship with UNLV and Josh Bondi and all the stuff that he's doing behind right. the scenes with the Natural History Museum this is some really really cool stuff around the edge of and I got to tell you I got to pinch myself I'm gonna be a part of that yeah well and the the other thing too that's so cool and, and councilman you've really been dialed in on this when that area and you alluded to this at the beginning when that area was out there so far from town hardly anyone got out there it didn't really need to be protected because no one really ventured out there now it's close enough to town that it does need to be protected because we're going to lose all those resources if we're not careful. And then. we need to protect them and manage them. Mm -hmm. And and I like to I want to promote them for the educational opportunities. 
uh, for people around the world who want to come see and experience that. Yeah. So the edge of town is right there. It will always be the edge of town now, which I'm pretty proud of. Our growth pattern will continue out US 95 in that direction, um, and we'll, we'll kind of side skirt it. But they're very, very exciting. I just received my letter from the Interior Secretary today uh, appointing me to that committee, and of course the mayor and the uh, city council unanimous, unanimously voted for me to be on that committee. So I look forward to serving in that capacity and taking full advantage of it. Well, like you said in your post on, on uh, Facebook, it, it's going to be around for generations to yep. come because of this work. So congratulations Thank on you. that. Another big event, last time you were on the show, you talked about Crime Prevention Night. Yep. And we talked about we really wanted people to come out and learn about that. So you posted on Facebook, uh, thank, uh, thank you to everyone who supported Crime Prevention and Preparedness Night. If you missed my newsletter, this week uh, we'll have information from the event. Uh, obviously it was well received, this is what we heard, some of the things, uh, some of the feedback. This comes from Larry Schultz. He said, very helpful and educational event, well done. So thanks, Larry, for uh, for responding on that. But it sounds like it was an event that uh, people could really have a lot of takeaways from. It was a crowded event. Uh, well over 200 people attended that uh, event that night, and necessary because there's 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 a, a, a system out there that reports when it, when a phone call gets made to 911 and that there's a crime reported in that location. And we learned through that that at that night that that's not always the case. If the call gets made, it gets reported, and those crime statistics are watched by a lot of people who live all throughout the valley exactly. in regards to the crime in their neighborhoods. So I get a lot of emails and a lot of phone calls about cr actual real crimes going on that, 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 that do happen. And then those reported crimes when someone dials 911, that there's just not that much crime going on in the neighborhoods. We have found in Ward 6 at Centennial Hills, there's, that's the least part, that's the least crime ridden area of the, of the city of Las Vegas. But uh, it was w very well attended. Of course, we had the sheriff out there with uh, uh, his folks. We had our own uh, Chief William McDonald with us. We had yeah. Dr. Slattery out there as well. Uh, we had the Metro volunteers. We had the uh, uh, Metro Explorers out there. Uh, uh, we were doing hands-only CPR training. It was a great event and people got a lot of their questions answered by those who could when it comes to public safety and crime prevention. Yeah. It was good, good for Kathy you Kathy Castle it. was out there too from Northwest Area Command who does the crime. She's a crime prevention specialist so she gave a great presentation and interestingly enough the residents and constituents that came, they came with some great oh. questions. What was the takeaway that you took from it? Something you learned that night that uh, kind of surprised you. It was actually that crime reporting mm -hmm. that people can look up and see where, where the crimes are taking place in their neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. uh, we had Don Jacobson who works for the City of Las Vegas in IT and he explained that that's not always the case. It may, it may show a crime occurred there, but that's not always the case. There, couldn't, there probably wasn't a victim. It was just somebody called in called and in. that got recorded. Right. So uh, what the call came in as and what actually took right. place sometimes can vary and that sometimes uh, Maybe alert ID, for it example, is going to give you something different from what Metro and, and, might. And that's it. On that's website. that's yeah. it. Alert ID, mm -hmm. and and also the, the takeaway too was folks don't recognize or realize how much each public safety department talks to the other. Mm -hmm. They're in constant communication. Metro has a fusion center that is constantly on 24-7. Uh, they're always monitoring everything. There's discussion between the fire departments, all the fire departments. So we've got a, you know, yeah. great fire chiefs in this valley and they're discussing issues that are going on. Uh, you know, there's been always talk about uh, Las Vegas being a target uh, of terrorism, which we don't ever want to see that. But I have to tell you, the men and women who are protecting the citizens of this city and this valley are the ones in, are doing the right thing. Yeah. And they're the ones we want. Well, good deal. It sounds like it was a great event. Was a great uh, event. You'll have more information, as you said, on your Facebook site if you missed, <laughs> if you missed, the, if you missed the evening. No problem. Councilman, let's shift gears a little bit, talk about some things going on in Ward 6. Uh, recently, back on February 8th, uh, you, me, and uh, other city staff went out to look at uh, the Silverstone um, community again. This is where, for the folks that aren't familiar, this is the golf course community uh, where the golf course was closed, where the owner of the course said it just can't make it go anymore. So now the residents are pretty concerned about what's going to happen to our, our golf course community if the golf course is gone. And it's actually golf courses. And so we were out there again making sure in the meantime that the place just doesn't go to weeds. And that's the big concern of the neighborhood. So I wanted them to know that we are still monitoring the situation, that uh, it is still forefront in our minds of, of what's happening and what's not happening. You know, part of that, a large portion of that is a drainage easement uh, that's part of our drainage system, a bigger system in, in the, on that side of town. But uh, it was great to see the turnout from the neighbors. I'm constantly getting texts, tweets, uh, messages on Facebook about what's going on, what's not going on. So the neighbors are watching. Uh, I'm really concerned about when the, the heat 
when it starts getting hot again, which it is right now as a matter of fact, and then the condition of those ponds and that existing water. But I can tell you, Vicky Ozuna and our code enforcement officers, this is a, a, a target for them as well. They're monitoring everything that's going on. We're monitoring the grass, whether it's getting watered or not. Um, certainly uh, the folks at Silverstone uh, have some litigation going on right now in the courts and that pl that's going to have to play itself out. Uh, but I've committed to them that the city will put the full backing of whatever we have available to us behind them. Right. And Councilman, for those that don't understand, a part of what's going on here is that even though the golf course is closed, you, the owner can't just let it uh, go fallow. He can't let it just turn into weeds uh, or into tumbleweeds by city code, he's got to maintain the property. And so that's what the city's role in this is to make sure that that area is still uh, green. It's not uh, uh, just a bunch the of weeds, dead grass. The pumps are still on, life safety issues. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly the clubhouse is an issue. Uh, we did have some vandalism going on, but so far so good with uh, who's managing it right now and that communication level exists, which is good to see. Also, too, you mentioned this, Councilman, the drainage easement. Uh, a lot of that golf course serves as natural drainage out there and that has to be open. We can't have it uh, plugged up with uh, tumbleweeds. Well, it's or... interesting, the conditions of approval for that golf course when it was first built, all of that was part of the hydrology study. Yeah. So those flows of water are coming across the desert floor into the detention basins, all that is taken into accountability. So you can't let the grass overgrow, you can't take the grass out, you have to have the right vegetation in there, you right. can't just you know, put, take out a bunch of rocks or put some decomposed granite in there. All of those elements are part of that hydrology study and part of their conditions of approval when they got built. Speaking of hydrology, floodwaters, uh, remnants of the Carpenter One fire still, uh, <laughs> uh, it's been what, three years ago now, still hanging in there. And those folks still remember, uh, uh, remember what was going on during that time period and how reactive we were when uh, you get six inches of rain in three hours in Kyle Canyon and it devastated the mountain. I mean, you, we saw the pictures. I see the flashback now, the devastation of the picnic areas, the roads. I mean, yeah. it was devastating. Jerry Walker again, you know, came over to my house and picked me up and said, come on, we got to go look at this. Zara. Took me up to that detention basin. His teams, they were spot on, ready to rock and roll when it came. We changed the name of Grand Teton uh, Street to the Grand Teton River because yeah. that's what it was, it was for several mess. days. And uh, for, you know, grateful for you folks that were patient with us as we dealt with that issue. Uh, we're not going to see that again, certainly not in a, I call that the 150 year yeah. flood pattern. Thank goodness that detention basin uh, to the west of Grand Teton was there. If it hadn't have been, and that's it would have been a tragic, yeah. tragic day. That's called the Kyle Canyon mm -hmm. Detention Basin. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, that thing filled up, yep. I mean, to just a, a few feet before it started to overflow. Uh, and it was tremendous where it was. This is the remnants here. This is near the enclave. Uh, on Grand Teton near Durango, just east of Durango. And uh, this was probably a, 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 a tough thing to clean out. Jerry had to figure out how we get in there and get all that s soot and mud out of those culverts. So this is the little uh, loader, mini loader that they use. And uh, I got a little instruction before I started to help them a little bit. I did feel a little uncomfortable. I didn't have my hard hat on and vest. So don't use that against me. <laughs> but uh, but see, after all this time, we're still still cleaning up yeah, after and that And that mud, I mean, it was still, you could still smell the smoke. I yeah, mean, you could still incredible. smell the forest fire. Wow. Hopefully we won't see anything like that. That's over with. So, and the, yeah. the flood project is complete. And uh, folks were patient enough during the flood project. But I think we worked pretty good, too, on communicating what the city and the contractor were doing yeah. in regards to that project. I thought so too. We had a lot of uh, meetings, neighborhood meetings. It was funny, remember we had one neighborhood meeting out there. Everybody was either on Facebook or Twitter. So yeah. that's how we communicated uh, what was going on. And the, the residents out there were, were great because they were very patient through all of that. It's interesting, the one neighborhood just there that is, uh, parallels Buffalo, um, a woman, when the, uh, the flood happened again, so we got rain a few days after that as well and it started flowing again, but she messaged me on Facebook to get the back gates unlocked so that they could get in and out of their neighborhood. And we used social media to get that communicated and you know, within, within an hour we had the yeah, gates opened up set. for it. Well, speaking of Grand Teton, let's talk about the improvements out there. Uh, had to do a lot <laughs> of work because, for folks, if you don't know, the detention basin was in place, thank goodness, but the underground pipe, the underground um, pipes that would carry the water from the detention basin under Grand Teton hadn't been installed yet. That's since changed. 
but that's why the water ran on the surface on along ground. Yeah, Grand reinforced Teton. concrete boxes that yeah, you could drive a truck not through. Not pipes, boxes. Yeah, yeah. Well, there are pipes too. Mm -hmm. But the conveyance system is in place now, and the flood took out all that vegetation on the median islands. Right. Some along the sidewalks as well. Um, it, it, it tore it all out. It did. Our director mm -hmm. of field operations, Jerry Walker, and we probably need to do a show just on Jerry mm -hmm. because this guy's a magician. <laughs> um, he did such a fabulous job. He and his crews have done miraculous things, but uh, it's great to see what he's doing now to repair the damaged medians. You've seen throughout the city of Las Vegas sculptures in our medians. Mm -hmm. um, you've seen it up on, uh, uh, on, up on Cheyenne. Yeah, Rampart. You've seen yeah. it on Rampart mm -hmm. Boulevard. Right. It's all over the valley, uh, but now he's working on on Grand Teton, and he's doing a fabulous job. Yeah, it's going to be beautiful. I mean, all of the wonderful statues that uh, that he's putting up out there. And what's exciting is people are looking forward to it. And it's funny because people will call up in a neighborhood farther down Grand Teton. Hey, are, are we you guys going to do yeah, ours? Yeah, yeah, when's that coming down? Well, the cool thing too is, you know, Arborview High School is right there. Right. And you know how high schools are about pride. So we're going to do something special for them. Oh, nice. Uh, and 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 try to do something for them in the median along uh, Grand Teton that that parallels the high school. They're the Aggies, right? Yeah, high up yeah, yeah. the Aggies. Right. The, right. the Arbor View Aggies, and so I've kind of I've talked to their uh, assistant principal about it and got some of her ideas. But uh, so Jerry's got some more work to nice. do. But I got to tell you, every council member is going to want this in their ward, and uh, I'm really excited about uh, uh, you know all of these wonderful sculptures that you see uh, at the, the end product that, that's going to be there. So everybody should get excited about that. Sounds good. Councilman, I want to tell everybody, too, you have some events coming up. Uh, you have four big events coming up in just in the next few weeks. You have a, a coffee with the Mayor Pro Tem on St. Patrick's Day, March 17th. There it is from 8 to 9. This is going to be at the Great Harvest Bread Company. Do you have to wear green that day? <laughs> you, you better wear you green better that wear day. You better wear green. That's yeah. right. It's St. Patty's Day. And, and I've been told by staff that it's not Irish coffee. So, uh, and, and I don't drink coffee. But uh, come on down there anyway, folks. Yeah. Uh, come on down and chat. Chit -chat. And let's talk about what's going on. We'll talk yeah. about the Grand Teton improvements, as a matter of fact. And if uh, my staff will remind me, Christine reminds me, I'll bring some pictures and uh, bring a map of what it's going to look like. And, Sounds good. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's a growing area down there. So, folks, love to see you down there. Come down and, and hang out with me for a while. Wonderful tradition out in your ward, uh, the Spring Celebration and uh, Foster Connect. This is April 2nd from noon to 4, and this is a wonderful event that connects foster kids with families. Uh, wonderful opportunity. So if you're interested in that, you got got maybe that something tugging on your, uh, your heart, maybe to consider adopting a child or consider uh, being a foster parent. It's a wonderful uh, event to attend. All of the vendors, well, I won't say all, but all, the, all of the vendors, a lot of the vendors associated with uh, adoption, foster care will be there. So, folks, if you're interested in being a foster family to a child out there who uh, has less than you do, come on out. It's a great event. We get 4,000 4, people out there. Mm -hmm. My youth council, of course, will have their annual dunk tank raising money oh, for their yeah. YNAP project. You're but, getting wet that yeah, day. Yeah, I'm going to get wet that day, and uh, they've been the assigned highlights. to bring principals or Ooh. football coaches or music directors from each high school. Yeah, so a lot of we'll get somebody from that. Metro. So come out and help the kids raise some money. I know my children line up when it's my turn. Compile. <laughs> yeah, You're going and, in. Yeah, I'm going in. And we've got some good video of that in years past. So, yeah, we'll be out there That's again. a great event, folks. It'll be, I mean, it's it's free to the public. We open up early for the foster families so their kids get to do it. There'll be a carnival out there, face painting, the whole nine yards. All right. And then on April 22nd, movie in the park coming up. Already movie in the park time. I am just shocked. It's that time already. That Inside Out's the movie. It's the Oscar winner, in fact. Well, and I got I have some kids in my neighborhood that uh, if they see me out uh, out in front of my house, they'll run down there and say, Councilman, when did the movie start? When did the movie start? <laughs> April 22nd, so Families kids. really enjoy this. This is a great opportunity, folks, to bring your families out to Centennial Hills Amphitheater. Take advantage of this great weather we're having. Uh, it is free. Bring your lawn chairs. Bring some pizza, some chicken, some sandwiches. Uh, you have to share with me, however. That's no, right. I'm That's the deal. Kidding. But it's a lot of fun. I know a lot of families are looking forward to it. And uh, this this type of movie is a movie that will fill the park yeah, up. Absolutely. Well, yeah, it just won the Oscar for Best Animated yeah. Picture. So, And then, last but not least, Shredding Event, April 23rd. Uh, just in time for get rid of all those old tax returns. This is the time to do it. Saturday, April 23rd, 10 o'clock. Another Come a little thing. early. It's all, it always oh, yeah. fills Get in line. So, it, will be, it will be behind the Centennial Hills Active Adult Center. It's on the library side, if you will. Uh, folks who have done this before know what site it's on, but uh, I should have, probably have some scouts out there. They always and direct traffic. They'll, they'll be direct, direct in traffic for me, 
and uh, get there early because I'll you know I'll be huffing and puffing and emptying boxes. All right. And what another that's another popular thing that we started a long time ago. That people love this. Yep. It helps them uh, keep their theft the ID theft down. Exactly, identity theft. And we're gonna uh, go to war against identity theft. That's the yep. idea here. So, well, Councilman, now we need to take a short break. But when we come back, no hero in heroin. We tell you what the nonprofit organization is doing to help recovering heroin addicts. That's next. So please stay with us. When you throw away money on wasted electricity, you're throwing away everything you could have bought with it. Saving energy saves you money. Welcome back to Access City Council. I'm your host, David Riggleman. Those who suffer from heroin addiction are getting much needed help from a local nonprofit organization here in town. And with us today to talk about No Hero in Heroin is Joe Engel who's the head of that organization. Uh, Joe, thanks so much for being on the show. Really appreciate you being here. Councilman, I know this is something that's so important. We talked about this. There are more people addicted to heroin in the community than, than I think most people would think or even realize, starting maybe from an injury, starting from prescription medication. Starting from their parents' and then, medicine and then, cabinet. And then sliding into... Sure, yeah something else. You know, David, even in President Obama's State of the Union uh, address, he mentioned the uh, epidemic of heroin in this, in this country. And I know every community is being affected by this. There are fa every family somewhere is going to be touched by this somehow. And we're not talking about it enough. Uh, you know, an opiate addict addiction is, is happening everywhere. And it's, it's a, a long process. It could be doctors over prescribing pain medications. It could be a, a number of things. And you mentioned some good ones. Uh, but what Joe has done with uh, There's No Hero in Heroin has been a phenomenal job. This is your third year, I think. We are coming up on our third year. Coming up yeah. on our third year, but the, he's making a difference in these people's lives. And it's not just the addict. It's the other family members yeah. that are affected by this. That's one of the things that's so key. You know, Joe, I think uh, f for people that may not know, and me included, uh, we kind of think of heroin as uh, people under a bridge somewhere uh, shooting up. But sure. it's far from that. This sure. is uh, in every neighborhood, in every school, uh, in every in every uh, in every part of our city now, isn't Ab it? Absolutely, that, that is correct. It, it, it is in suburbia. It, it, it's no longer an inner city drug. It, it, it's in high schools. It's at work. It's in the libraries. It's it's where, wherever there's people. There's heroin. Now, Joe, I know you have your own story to tell that's close to all of this. Um, former addict yourself. How how do people? Is it through uh, prescription medication? Is it from an injury? Uh, does a friend get them started? Or is it all those things that, that, that kind of lead, all of the above. lead people down For that? Sure. How do you know if you've got a problem in your, in your home? Maybe your child, uh, maybe a family member is a user. Uh, well, you suspect, but you're not quite sure. The information's out there. You know, I mean, all of the information out there, what to look for. You know, the, the red eyes, the face, flushed face. They, you know, sleeping on and off you know, erratic behavior. All, all of those things came true in my life. You know, I lost my oldest son to a heroin overdose. He was 19 years old. Yeah, um, and all, all of those things, I, I look back and I wonder how I missed it. What did I miss? And this happens overnight, too. I mean, this, 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 I mean you, your story, too. I mean, this just happened, and all of a sudden, what the heck? What did I miss? And this is happening to a lot of families out there. So I think the message that I want to convey and Joe wants to convey to folks out there that may be dealing with this is there's help. And I think that's the important thing. There's people out there that can help. Um, uh, I, I truly believe in our city, in this valley, in southern Nevada, we have a, a demon on our back, and it's, it's uh, the opiate addiction. And people are taking pain pills. Those are just, that's just synthetic heroin. That's all that is. Absolutely. That's and, what it is. And unfortunately for an addict, whether they're suffering from pain or addiction or any of the, all of the above, you know, that lore tab on the street has a certain value, but it's uh, a dime bag of, of heroin. It's 10 bucks. You know, and that's what's delivered. Here. Delivered. Delivered, even. I mean, delivered. that's, that's one how phone calls. They got business hours, nine to nine, seven days a week. And the addicts know this. So they set up their, you know, $5, $10 worth, and, and it'll be delivered to you within 20 minutes. Joe, how do we win this battle? <laughs> I'm, starting one, I'm starting with one addict at a time. <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, how to win? We, we need a whole change of social perception on, on the way that we deal with it. Addiction and recovery, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's it. This it is, is it is a health issue. It's a disease. Right, it's, it's a disease, and 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 it 
it's the biggest health crisis of our time. And you talk to law enforcement. You know, there's kids out there using or even adults using and they get picked up for uh, possession or what have you. They, they just get incarcerated. They're not getting the help that they need. So dealing with the disease. And I think at my level and Joe's level, we're talking about it. And I think that's the most important thing we can do is get this out of the back room and out of the back alley, front and center in this community's eyes and mind and make a difference. I think awareness is one thing. Sure. Uh, because there's families that don't know they have this problem yet, and we certainly don't want to wish this upon them at all, but it's affecting a lot of people. And, and I'm going to stand by Joe uh, as long as he's going through this, down this journey, and we're going to do this together. I've known Joe since we were kids and growing up with him. He's a good man. He's got an amazing family, and I'm proud to call him my friend. Joe, uh, people that need help, how do they get started? Well, you know, you, you brought up that I was actually... Um, an addict myself, uh, uh, you know, 21 years ago. Um, I, I, I'm currently, have been clean for a long time. And, and, and that was part of my drive to start this organization. I mean, there I was connected to the recovery community at the time. And when my son was in the depths of his addiction, I didn't know where to take him. I didn't know where to go. And if I'm connected to the recovery community and I don't know where to go, what about the parent who isn't in the recovery community? So that, that was part of, my, part, part of the drive to start this. And, and, and where can they go? they can go to their doctor first. The, the emergency room, if somebody is in the middle of a, a, an addiction and they cannot get treatment, go to the emergency room. How can they get involved with your organization and get information from you? Follow me on Twitter, like me on Facebook. I, I have a, um, my website is, you know. There's no hero in heroin, Tin High? How yeah, the, Tin High Las Vegas. That, that is the acronym for there is no hero in heroin. T-I-N-H-I-H, Las Vegas right. dot info. So the, just search me on Facebook and Twitter. It's the easiest way to find Joe me. Joe also sponsors a Black Monday um, event. You want to talk about our that? Annual, our annual, our signature event. I am actually, I started off being a daughter foundation from a, from a foundation out of uh, it's Tucson, Arizona. And five years ago, they started a, a, a part celebration of life, part for fundraiser, part memorial. And, and they called it Black Monday. And this is Dr. Slattery that came to yours. Absolutely, and, and and he was a great last-minute entry, as a matter of fact. He, Dr. You know, Slider is uh, the chief medical officer for the city of Las Vegas for our uh, fire department. Las Vegas Fire and Rescue. He gave a great presentation. And that particular presentation is um, Narcan Naloxone, which actually just got passed this past legislative session with Senate Bill 459, which we had actually testified during last last uh, legislative season. Right. But and he saves an addict, right, Joe? In if the first responder gets there, or the parent, whoever finds the addict, if they find somebody in the middle of an overdose, of, of an opiate-related overdose, if they inject them with a naloxone or the nasal, nasal version, Narcan, it actually is an opiate inhibitor. And it, it, it take, takes over from the, the opiate receptors and, and, and kicks the opium molecule directly off the receptors and revives them, puts, the, awesome. puts the addict straight into withdrawal. And, and, and the thought process behind that is you can't get somebody clean if they're dead. And we're going to be doing some training at the Centennial Hills Community Center with Las Vegas Fire and Rescue. Dr. Slattery's coming out. Joe will be out there. And we'll be doing more of these trainings in the city to help yeah. these families. Joe, pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks for having Sorry me. Sorry for your loss, but I'm so I glad that you're that. helping other people uh, avoid what you've experienced. So Thank you, David. Right. Thank you, David. I want to tell everybody out there uh, that if you'd like to get in touch with uh, Councilman Ross, and listen, we always want to hear from you. So if you have something that you'd like to share, he is always on Facebook, always on Twitter. Uh, you can also contact him the old-fashioned way. Pick up the telephone. There's the number, 702-229-6154. Or you can send us an email. His address is councilman-sross at lasvegasnevada.gov. Again, Joe, thanks for being on the show. Councilman, usually at this part of the show we say, hey, we'll see you in six weeks. But uh, can't say that this time. Um, you're planning to, to run for another office. So our rules say we got to put you on hiatus through that election cycle. So... We'll see one way or the other at the end of the cycle. It's been a so. nice run, Dave. <laughs> nice person. Nice Thanks for person. having me on. Great job. And, uh, Joe, keep up the good work with you. Look forward to hearing more about your organization and uh, the good you're going to do in our community. Again, right. thank you. Thanks to you both. We want to thank you for joining us for this edition of Access City Council. Don't miss our next show beginning on March 17th with Councilwoman Lois Tarkane. And don't forget, you can watch us live on the Internet at kclv.tv. Thanks for watching, everyone. We'll see you next time around.